Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. Uh, and this is for the week of, what is it, December 20th to 26th, I think. Um, it's episode 87. Uh, and um, I'm glad you're with us. Uh, for about the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. If you have any responses to anything I say here, you can contact me directly. The email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Um, if you do send me email, please um, be sure to include something like uh, the left side, uh, left side of the aisle or, or your cable show or something like that and the subject line so I know it's not spam. And by the way, if you didn't catch the email, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed in the screen several times through the show. You can get the email address from there. All right, so with that, I got uh, one thing I'm going to be talking about today, just one topic for the entire show. So it starts by noting that a week ago, I gave my first Hero Award to Jason Whitlock and Bob Costas, for having the courage to speak out about our gun culture. Um, little did they know or little did I know how appropriate their words would soon become. On Friday, December 14th, 20-year-old Adam Lanza, wearing combat gear armed with two semi-automatic pistols and a semi-automatic rifle, killed 27 people, including 20 small children, in an attack at Sandy Hook Elementary School, school in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, Lanza was brutally efficient, chillingly accurate in his attack, so much so that the evidence indicates that most of the victims, including the children, were shot at point-blank range. The names Sandy Hook and Newtown now join an ever-lengthening list of names that include places like Columbine, Aurora, Virginia Tech, and dozens of other places that represent more, uh, something more than just geographic. Now, the shock, especially the shock and the horror of having six- and seven-year-old children being shot down, spurred the reemergence of a phrase that has not been seen in our culture for quite some time. Gun control. Gun control. People are talking about it. The question is, are we going to get it? Well, not if the right-wingers have their way. Now, it's worth noting at the top, though, that not a single pro-gun legislator, not a single pro-gun Washington politician would agree to appear on either Meet the Press or Face the Nation on the Sunday following the massacre. And the NRA, the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, has been unnaturally and happily silent. Even its website, uh, rather its uh, Facebook page, was taken down. Now, as of today, this is being taped on Wednesday. Uh, they say they're going to have a press conference on Friday with some major statement. I have to admit, I don't expect it will be any different than what they've been dumping on us for years. But meanwhile, other bozos have not been so reticent. For example, Representative Mike, uh, Mike Rogers says gun control is the one thing I hope does not happen. Herman Cain the man who proved that a black candidate for president can be just as much a waste of good air as any white one, uh, declared himself disgusted by those people who dare to suggest that, golly gee whiz, maybe Newtown should make us want to kind of think about, you know, guns and stuff. For his part, former Arkansas Governor uh, Mike Huckleberry Hound uh, insisted he knows why Newton happened. It's because, he said, we have systematically removed God from our schools. This is what he said. We don't have a crime problem, a gun problem, or even a violence problem. We have a sin problem. Representative Louis Gomer to Governor Rick Perry, who together reduced the average IQ of Texas by 20 points, insists that they know that the answer, the way to prevent more massacres in the United States, is for more Americans to carry guns. Perry wants teachers and administrators to be able to carry concealed weapons in the schools, and Gomer told Fox News, where else, uh, I wish to God, he said, I wish to God that the principal of Sandy Hook School, her name was Dawn Huxsprung, and she was killed trying to rush Lanza. I wish to God that she had an M4 in her office so that when she heard the gunfire, she can take it out and take him down and take his head off before he can kill any of those precious children. Well, you know what? I don't want to hear it. 
I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear the gobbledygook. I don't want to hear the, 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 the excuses. I don't want to hear the nonsense, the lies, the garbage. Um, I don't want to hear the kind of noxious venom spewing from the fangs of the snakes at the NRA. I don't want to hear the slimy excuses, the shop-worn uh, uh, slogans. I don't want to hear the stale talking points obediently invoked by the, by the nut guns, uh, the gun nuts uh, uh, bought off lackeys in Congress. What's more, I don't want to hear it from the Obama sycophants, the Obama bots for who he can do nothing wrong and who will just whine that he's doing the best he can at those mean old Republicans. Especially not when there are things he can do on his own without going to Congress, like banning the import of assault weapons could be done by executive order. Which means I especially do not want to hear any of this, any mealy mouth platitudes, any more blather from Mr. Nobel Peace Prize president himself, President Hopi Changey, who talks big about meaningful change, even though he has never been a leader on the issue of gun control, not as a state senator, not as a U.S. senator, not as president, not as a candidate. In fact, this last fall, he got one question in the entire campaign, got one question about gun control. That was about banning assault weapons. And his answer was pap about wanting to start a broader conversation about violence. Actually, he's done nothing about guns. Actually, no, I take that back. He has done something about guns. He's expanded the areas where you can carry them. Thanks to legislation approved and defended in court by the glorious Mr. O, you can now transport a gun via Amtrak. You can now carry a concealed loaded gun into national parks. So, you know, don't, don't expect me to get all gooey about uh, Obama's supposed commitment to meaningful action. Uh, and especially don't expect me to get gooey about it when his, when his uh, representative, when Jay Carney, his press secretary, is telling reporters that Obama does not want to politicize a tragedy. He said, and I'm quoting, there will be a day for discussion of the usual Washington policy, policy debates, but today is not that day. So what the hell day is the day? How many more have to die before it's the day? How many more have to be shot down before it's the day? How many mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons have to lie in a pool of their own blood before it's the day? How many children have to call for mommy after a fall or a bee sting only to have someone explain to them as gently as they can, remind them that mommy isn't there anymore? How many wives have to wake up in the middle of the night and reach across the bed and be confused for a moment before they remember the pain of knowing why the other side of the bed is empty? How many parents have to have that yawning, aching emptiness again and again when they're in the grocery store and reach for something and then remember, I don't need to buy that particular kind of cereal anymore. I don't need to buy that kind of peanut butter anymore. How many times does that have to happen before it's the day? The days of those children, those spouses, those parents are not measured in minutes, but by pains. They are not marked by hours, but by ache. So what day is the day? And why is that day not today? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear any of it. Not the time. Of course it's the time. It's past the time. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, proving he's not a complete jerk, said that, according him, calling for meaningful action is not enough. We need immediate action. So now Obama says he'll support a bill to ban assault weapons that Dianne Feinstein is going to introduce in the new Congress. Well, whoop de doo Mr. President. You'll support it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to push it? What political pressure are you prepared to bring? What political capital are you prepared to, to expend? Don't give me words. You've already given all of us lots and lots and lots of words. Don't give me words. Give me honest to gosh actions or don't give me anything. Give me actions if you expect me to take you seriously. There are more today, more than 310 million guns in civilian hands in the United States. That is about half of all of the weapons in civilian hands in the entire world. 
There were 16,000 murders in the United States last year, 12,000 of them. 75%, three quarters of all murders in the United States last year were committed with guns. More than 60,000 more people were wounded by guns, some of them disabled permanently, physically or mentally. A gun in the home is 22 times more likely to be used for murder, suicide, or an accidental shooting than it is to be used in self-defense. The U.S. has a murder rate of 2.8 per 100,000, is for gun murders, 2.8 per 100,000. That is the highest rate in the entire industrialized world. In fact, it's more than, it's, it's, uh, um, se it's almost seven times more than the next 22 countries combined. Compared to Great Britain, you are 100 times, remember, we're not talking about absolute numbers. We're talking about this is the rate, this is the chance, this is the risk. You are 100 times more likely to be killed by a gun in the United States than you are in Great Britain, which despite, by the way, its rather strict gun controls, and despite what the, what the uh, uh, polluted fantasies of the right wing would tell us, they do manage to have maintained some apparent modicum of freedom, despite having gun control. Every day we wait, more people die. Every day we wait, more people have been killed with guns. There have been at least 62 mass killings in the United States over the last 30 years. In at least 49 of those cases, the guns were obtained legally. Of the weapons used, 72%, nearly three quarters, were either uh, uh, assault weapons or semi-automatic handguns. Oh, and by the way, by the way, do you know how many of these people, how many of these incidents were ended by some, some civilian packing heat who turned into Rambo and took down the shooter? None, not one. It has never happened. There have been 23 mass shootings in the United States in just the last six years. Now bear in mind here that mass shooting is defined as at least five people being killed in a single incident. We're going to go through that list. February 12, 2007, Salt Lake City, Utah. An 18-year-old rampaged through the Trolley Square shopping center until he was killed by police. Six dead, four wounded. February 14, 2008, a former Illinois University student, 27-year-old Stephen Philip Kazmierczyk, opened fire on the campus, killing five people and then himself. April 16, 2007, Virginia Tech campus, Blacksburg, Virginia. Swing Hui Cho, a senior at the school, shot and killed 32 of his classmates before committing suicide. 33 dead, 23 wounded. October 7, 2007, Crandon, Wisconsin. Tyler Peterson, 20, killed six people, including his ex-girlfriend, at a post-homecoming party. Seven dead, one wounded. December 5, 2007, Omaha, Nebraska. Robert Hawkins, 19, went on a shooting spree at the West Roads Mall, killing eight people and then himself. Nine dead. February 7, 2008, Kirkwood, Missouri. A gunman opened fire at a public meeting in the city hall, killing six people before he was shot and killed by police. Seven dead, one wounded. June 25, 2008, Henderson, Kentucky. After an argument with his boss at the Atlantis Plastics Plant, Wesley Higdon, 25, killed five colleagues and then himself. Six dead, one wounded. March 10, 2009, Geneva County, Alabama. A 25-year-old man killed his mother and then drove 10 miles to kill several members of his extended family, a couple of neighbors, and a bystander. The victims range in age from 18 months to 74 years. 11 dead, 6 wounded. March 29, 2009, Carthage, North Carolina. A gunman opened fire on a nursing home, killing 7 residents and a nurse. 8 dead, 3 wounded. April 3, 2009, Binghamton, New York. Jivali Wong, a naturalized immigrant from Vietnam, gunned down students and employees at the American Civic Association where he'd been taking English lessons. 14 dead, four wounded. November 5, 2009, Fort Hood, Texas. In the deadliest shooting to ever happen on an American military base, an army major serving as a psychiatrist went on a, sh on a shooting spree that killed 13. 13 dead, 30 wounded. November 29, 2009, Parkland, Washington. A Washington man walked into a coffee shop, shot four police officers execution style before being killed himself. Five dead. 
August 3rd, 2010, Manchester, Connecticut. A driver for the Hartford Beer Distributors killed eight people and then himself in a workplace shooting. Nine dead, two wounded. January 8, 2011, Tucson, Arizona. Jared Lee Lochner, 22, opened fire in a Safeway parking lot, killing six people and injuring others, including Representative Gabriel Giffords, who was shot in the head at point-blank range. Six dead, 14 wounded. September 6, 2011, Carson City, Nevada. Eduardo Sencion opened fire in an IHOP and then killed himself. Five dead, seven wounded. October 12, 2011, Seal Beach, California. Scott Evans Decry, 41, stormed a hair salon where his ex-wife worked and killed eight people. Eight dead, one wounded. February 12, 2012, Norcross, Georgia. A man shot and killed two of his sisters and their husbands and then killed himself in a Korean health spa. Five dead. April 2nd, 2012, Oikos University, Oakland, California. 43-year-old Won Go, a former student at the largely Korean Christian campus, entered the school in open fire. Seven dead, three wounded. May 31st, 2012, Seattle, Washington. A man opened fire in a cafe, fatally wounded four people, then killed another in a carjacking before killing himself. Six dead. July 20th, 2012, Aurora, Colorado. During a midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises, a gunman opened fire in the, in the suburban Denver movie theater, killing 12, injuring dozens of others. 12 dead, 59 wounded. August 5th, 2012, Oak Creek, California, Oak, uh, Wisconsin rather. Uh, white supremacist Wade Michael Page entered a Sikh temple and opened fire in the congregants. He later shot and injured a police officer responding to the scene. Seven dead, four wounded. September 27, 2012, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Andrew John Engeldinger, recently laid off from the accent signage systems, entered the office building and opened fire. Seven dead, two wounded. December 12, 2012, Newtown, Connecticut. The shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School was the second deadliest school shooting in the U.S. history, leaving 27 dead, including 20 young children. And that is just the mass shootings, at least five people killed. This is a list. I got six more that occurred just this year, but that didn't make the cut because there weren't five people killed. July 8th, Dover, Delaware. Three persons walked into a soccer field and killed the tournament organizer and a 16-year-old player. Two other persons were injured by random gunfire. Two dead, two wounded. July 17th, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. A gunman with a military-style assault rifle went to the house of a man he thought knew someone else, shot him, then walked into a crowded bar and started shooting. 17 wounded. August 13th, College Station, Texas. A 35-year-old man, a self-proclaimed gun enthusiast, killed a constable and a passerby and wounded four others before police killed him. Three dead, four wounded. August 24th, 2012, New York City. Ten people are shot, two of them fatally, by a disgruntled former employee named Jeffrey Johnson outside the Empire State Building. Two dead, eight wounded. October 21st, Brookfield, Wisconsin. A man walked into a spa, killed his wife and two other women, and wounded four before killing himself. Four dead, four wounded. Finally, December 11th. Portland, Oregon. A gunman wielding an assault rifle opened fire in a, in a mall crowded with Christmas shoppers, killing two and wounding at least one before being found dead, apparently by his own hand. Three dead, one wounded. We are going to take a break while you think about that. So to that list, we're back from our break. That list I just went through, that list seemed long, that it seemed tedious. Imagine how tedious it is to the families that are left behind. Imagine how tedious it is to the, the friends and the family for whom these are not words, they are people. For who these are not memories, they are ongoing feelings. Uh, then for them, this list was not written in type, it was written in blood. Every day, every day we delay, every day we wait, that list gets longer. But, oh, yeah, oh, you're here. This is what we hear. Oh, yes, it's terrible. Such a terrible, terrible tragedy. But it's the price we pay for freedom. Yes, the deal. The price we pay for the freedom provided by the Second Amendment, the very amendment that guarantees our freedom. Yeah, bull hockey. 
Now, I'm going to have to get a little bit legalistic on you, unfortunately, but it's necessary because you can be damn sure that the right-wingers and the gun knots are going to trot out the Second Amendment argument over and over again. The argument that goes, I can have my guns. The Constitution says so. All right, first, let's be clear on what the Constitution actually says. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of, a peop- right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's the entire text of the Second Amendment. Now, the first important Supreme Court case about the Second Amendment was Presser v. Illinois. This was decided in 1886. In it, the Supreme Court found that the Second Amendment only limited Congress and the federal government, not the states, that the states could pretty much do whatever they wanted. Uh, That decision was actually affirmed by Miller v. Texas, which was decided in 1894. Now, this was largely before the idea of incorporation. This is before the idea that the protections of the Constitution applied to the states as well as the federal government. So those decisions really aren't relevant for the legal situation we're in today. The point is, they do mean that right off the top, this nonsense that always throughout our history we've been able to have whatever guns we wanted is complete nonsense. It's completely, totally bogus. All right, the next important case, and this is the big one, uh, it was U.S. v. Miller. This was in 1939. It concerned the National Firearms Act of 1934. That act uh, required that certain types of weapons be registered and taxed. A unanimous court upheld that law, saying there was no conflict with the Second Amendment. The court found that, I'm quoting here, the, 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 uh, the grammar is a little bit, mm, but you'll be able to understand. I'm quoting the court's decision. In the absence of any evidence tending to show the possession or use of a weapon of the sort that was involved in the case has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. With obvious purpose to ensure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment was made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. For 69 years, that was precedent. That was the precedent relied on by all lower courts. Uh, and it was actually referred to occasionally by the Supreme Court. For 69 years, the legal standard was that states and the federal government were within their legitimate powers to regulate sale and possessions of weapons which were not related to maintaining a well-regulated militia, which in the absence of the existence of state militias, except to the extent the National Guard might be considered that, but in the basic absence of these state militias, that pretty much meant any gun at all. Put another way, What the courts were finding, the precedent was that the guarantees of the Second Amendment was not an individual right, but a collective one. It was reserved to the people as a whole, not to discrete individuals. Well, after 69 years of precedent, the narrowest majority of the Supreme Court, five to four, decided to ignore those standards, decided to ignore that precedent, or more to the point, declare them irrelevant. In 2008, in the case District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment does provide an individual right to own a firearm for traditional lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. Now, that decision only applied to federal enclaves, such as the District of Columbia. But two years later, in McDonald v. Chicago, that same 5-4 to majority said that, no, this actually applies to the states as well. This is what the gun nuts rely on. This is what they, this is what they argue. Can't have gun control. Gun, uh, Second Amendment says so. Supreme Court said so. Debate's over. All right, the first thing, actually, is to ask any of those wackos if at any of that time before 2008, if in any of those 69 years of precedent, at any point did any of them say, oh, the Supreme Court ruled the debate's over? You know, of course they didn't. So there's no reason they should, should expect us to do it now. The other thing is more important. Those nuts, and in fact a lot of gun control advocates, don't know what Heller and McDonald actually said. Now, I'm not going to discuss all the legal convolutions that the Supreme Court had to go to in order to find that the first clause of this amendment relating to a militia was completely disconnected from the second clause about bearing arms. The point is, I don't have to. 
In Heller and reasserted in McDonald, the majority of the Supreme Court embraced the essence of the 1939 Miller decision that the federal government and the states had the authority to regulate firearms and then argued that the Second Amendment only applies to weapons in common use for lawful purposes. In fact, the court said, uh, and I'm quoting the ruling here, the ruling should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. The majority also said that other prohibitions, such as banning concealed weapons or the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons, were unaffected by the decision. But here's the real kicker. In those decisions, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment provided an individual right to own a gun for usual and lawful purposes, and they actually referred to self-defense within the home. In other words, under this decision, you have a constitutional right to have a gun in your home, but not necessarily anywhere else. So the gun nuts who claim that the Second Amendment gives them the right to have pretty much any kind of gun they want, any time they want, anywhere they want, and as many as they want, they're wrong. They are simply wrong. Heller and McDonald are far more limited than the gun nuts hope and the gun and the gun control advocates fear. Carrying concealed weapons can be banned. Carrying guns into schools or government buildings or on an Amtrak train or into a national park, that can be banned. Assault weapons can be banned. Semi-automatic handguns can be banned. High-capacity magazines can be banned. Safety locks can be required. Dangerous and unusual ammunition like hollow-point bullets or armor-piercing shells can be banned. Now, will any of that happen? Maybe, maybe a little of it. I don't know. Uh, given the gross cowardice of the Democrats in Washington, I kind of doubt it, but maybe. The shooting in Newtown has touched the national nerve in a way few things have. But there's one thing, a bottom line. Based on current jurisprudence, the truth that is that pretty much any kind of gun other than an ordinary rifle, a shotgun, or a plain handgun can be banned. And frankly, they should be. Ban them. Ban them all. You want to hunt? Use a basic rifle. Do not even try to tell me that you need an AR-15 to take down a deer. In fact, you want to hunt? Use a bow and arrow. Or is the, is the extra effort involved in tracking the deer to get close enough in order to take it down with the bow instead of dropping it from a couple of hundred yards away with your manhood? Too much effort for you. If you want to if, if target shoot, use a pellet gun. Yeah, 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 I know they can be dangerous. But do not even try to tell me you need a Glock to shoot out a, a bullseye in a paper target. Ban them all. Now, I know that's not going to happen. I know there's no chance of that in my lifetime, and probably much longer, if in fact ever. But it's not going to stop me from saying it. It's not going to stop me from wanting it. And as long as I am a hundred times more likely to be killed by a gun here than I am in Great Britain, I'm going to keep on saying it, and I'm going to keep on wanting it. Ban them. Ban them all. All right, that's it. I'm done. Now... I will tell you that next week, the holiday week between Christmas and New Year's, um, I'm going to try to have something a little lighter, something a little happier. Um, so we can look forward to that, that hopefully I'll actually give myself cause to smile at something for once in a while. But in any event, for the moment, you just have the best week you possibly can. We are out of here. Happy holidays. Peace. <laughs>